This is Law and Order SVU Season 1, Episode 19, Contact. And just wait for it, because this one's got a weird ending. We open up to a blonde businesswoman getting on the subway. She's got a to-go coffee, she's on her phone, but just before one of the stops, some dude whips out a switchblade, comes up behind her, open your mouth and I'll slit your throat, bitch, and proceeds to rape her on the subway in front of everybody. People are minding their own business, looking away. We're at the precinct and we're discussing the details of the case. Guess what? This MO matches a whole bunch of other rape cases on the subway. This is a repeat offender. Seven times in the last six months. Three times this month. Munch and Jeffries are at the scene and we meet a couple of repeat characters this episode. One is the subway cop who continuously gives them the details of all these cases. The other is this reporter who seems to always be there. His name is Nick Ganson. They've got the whole crime scene locked down, but they're not having a lot of luck though because... It's a subway and it's covered in nasty fingerprints, partial footprints, you know, it's a mess. Benson and Stabler are interviewing Jen, the latest victim. If I hadn't stopped for coffee, I would have been on a different train. Stabler very obviously has a raging cold. He also has a composite sketch from the other victims. Yeah, looks kind of like him. She describes the perpetrator. Thin, sandy brown hair with a pointy beak nose, dark clothes, he had his hoodie up, he left his mark on her dress. Oh, well that's convenient. Hello, DNA. Benson and Stabler tracked down some other passengers that were on the subway at the same time. This one smarmy businessman guy, he's a little helpful. He's also a dick. He noticed the perpetrator had dirty pants on, like paint drips. Cause he remembers thinking, I gotta stay away from that guy cause I don't wanna get paint on my coat. Benson's like, did you see him before he started attacking her? No, I didn't notice him. So you saw him attacking her and your thought was to protect your coat. Great guy. Great guy. Munch and Jeffries go and talk to, I don't know, like the fucking captain of the subway police. Is that a thing? His name is Greenberg and tells them that his pattern is there is no pattern. Jeffrey says, well, then why don't we set people up on these trains to keep an eye out for him? There ain't enough cops in this city to keep a guy from putting his hand up a girl's skirt. And Jeffries is not about him minimizing these attacks, so she gets right up in his face. Um, excuse me, we're talking about rape, Greenberg. We're back at the precinct, and Craigan introduces Dr. Audrey Jackson. She is a forensic psychologist, and she is joining the team. Oh, okay. Cool. You can tell there's a little bit of pushback. They don't want to expand the group. Are they going to have enough love in their hearts for another person? Okay, whatever. What do we have on this guy? Uh, I don't know. He's a painter. And then boom, Dr. Audrey Jackson is on it. She just starts profiling to earn her keep. Okay, here's what I think. He's a dog. He likes to hunt. He gets on the subway with maybe an hour to spare. Maybe he's got all day waiting for the perfect victim. It's like foreplay to him. We can't plant somebody because he doesn't have a type. So what do we do? We fucking wait. Munch pops his little pee head in. The wait's over, we got another victim. We're talking to the same cop as before. He is mighty proud of himself. Here's what happened. An old lady sees this guy rubbing up on a woman. Another guy puts him in a headlock and then the third guy pulls the emergency brake. At which time I came and arrested the perpetrator. Yes, very good, that is your job. Benson and Stabler are with the suspect in an interrogation room. The suspect's name is Bruce. I did a bad job writing down last names this episode. He maintains that the train jerked and he fell against her. Okay, well, we're gonna need your pants. On the other side of the glass, Dr. Jackson's like, I don't know if I like this guy for it. He's nervous, lack of eye contact. He's like a kid who's lying about a book he read. Stabler is holding this guy's pants, looks in him and says, we'll go ahead and send this sample away for testing. And what's this? The left pocket is cut out. Benson says, that's the oldest trick in the book, Bruce. Hey, you want some change? Maybe some mints? Reach into my pocket. But when they do, there's no change in there. It's just your willy, Bruce. I want the sound clip of Benson saying, it's just your willy, Bruce, as my ringtone. But he has an explanation. Uh, I must have cut that open accidentally with the box cutter that I keep in my pocket. Oh my gosh, Bruce. Okay, uh, 
let's Mirandize this motherfucker because he's just giving the game away. Ooh, then there's a little exchange between Benson and Nick the reporter. He wants more information about the subway rapist case. And she says, you can come and get it over dinner. I'm paraphrasing. Munch and Jeffries are following up with the latest victim. They talk to Dr. Unibrow. No penetration. She says nothing happened. The victim herself is like, no, he did not rape me. So Cregan and Dr. Jackson are button heads a little bit here. Dr. Jackson says, he didn't rape her, dude. I don't think he's good for the other ones either. Cregan said, the only reason he didn't rape her is because he didn't get the chance. Okay. We need all the victims to try and identify Bruce. Let's get all seven of them in. And Dr. Jackson's like, um, we're sending a car for them, right? Cragen's like, what the f- No, they can take the train. <laughs> the train that they got raped on? We cannot re-traumatize them and then hope to get a good ID. Oh yeah, okay, that makes- we'll, we'll send cars. They bring all seven victims in. They are all traumatized in their own way. Some are jumpy, some just cry. One lady's like, I see this guy in every man on the street. How am I supposed to recognize him here in front of me? One woman identifies Bruce positively, but overall that's not enough to go on. All right, so the new strategy is we get him to admit to fondling a stranger on the subway, which is still not cool, but we don't think he did the rapes. Once again, earning her keep, Dr. Jackson goes in to meet with Bruce. Hi, Bruce. I'm Dr. Jackson. I'm a court appointed shrink. You're not being charged with the rapes. They know that you didn't do it. He's like, oh, really? Awesome. She says, do you like riding subways, Bruce? You know, trying to get in his head. And he just wants to tell a story. I came to New York from South Dakota. I don't know what happened. It just all fell apart. So that day I got wasted and went to a porno place. Next thing I know, I was on the subway. I see. So you had already relieved yourself before you got on the subway. You weren't looking for sex. I was just lonely. I just wanted some contact. Name of the episode, everybody drink. So Cregan is watching her be awesome at her job. So I don't know what is up his butt when she walks out and he still wants to pick a fight. She says, he's not violent. Oh yeah, well he carries a box cutter. Yeah, to open boxes, Captain. Yeah, okay, so why is he not our rapist? Explain that to me. Because we're looking for a power rapist. Someone who feels powerless and then uses violence to gain control. Once he gets that control, he uses it to prove his virility. Once he's done, he feels powerless again. That's why he wants to be caught. We jump over to Barology, where Benson is looking like sex on a stick. She is with Nick, the reporter from The Post, and she knows what she wants. But Nick just wants to talk about the subway rapist and about how she works with sex crimes, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, thanks, Nick, for the reminder. Then they're making out in her apartment. Next thing you know, he's behind her and says, let's pretend I'm the subway rapist. What the fuck? Oh, oh, no. I'm gonna go take a shower. You can see yourself out. And he sure does, but not before looking at her confidential files. And the next day, Cragen calls Benson into his office. Hey, um, this article that just came out from Nick the Dick sounds a lot like he was talking to somebody who knows the case a lot. Olivia, never turn your back on a reporter. Do you want me to handle this? No, I'll fucking handle this. Munch pops his little head in and says, there's been another subway rape. They didn't catch the guy, but this time somebody grabbed his coat and a card flew out. What was the card? It was a parking stub from Queens at 6.45 that morning. We go to that lot. And the guy who works there, he's skimming a little off the top, but he does know the guy. He describes him as white, skinny, with a pointy nose. He drives a van and a truck, but they're both from Duels. Duels Painting Contractors. He works for a painting company. They go to Duels Painting Contractors and find out from the boss. He's like, yeah, I have one white guy that works for me. His name is Sal, and he takes really long lunch breaks sometimes. Let's bring Sal in. Munch is my favorite in this scene. They're looking in his wallet. What is this second license? It's for Cedra Lonstein. Who is she, Sal? What else do we have in here? Oh, a Metro card. So we'll have a full record of all your travels 
perfect. Now they bring all the victims in for another lineup. This time Sal is in the lineup and he wants to be number one. The first victim comes in. It's Jen from the very first scene. Before all the guys are even in, she says it's number one. She goes to take off but remembers her scarf. She goes to the room with all the other victims to grab it. And when she's in there, they ask her how it went. She makes a quip about how it didn't take very long, just like him, and contaminates the rest of the witnesses. So now I got a problem. We're at the Supreme Court and the defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney are making their case to the judge. That witness pool is contaminated as fuck. We can't use any of that shit. The only other thing that they have on him is like a parking stub. Um, and seven DNA samples. Yeah, but that just proves that they had sex, not that it was rape. We move to dismiss and the judge doesn't like it, but case dismissed. Everybody is pissed. I'm sorry, consensual sex on a subway with a stranger who has a box cutter to your throat? Okay, what do we have? What about this Cedra Lonstein? The ID that he had? Let's track her down. She could be an uncontaminated witness. We detour again to the post where Nick the Dick reporter works. You see Benson handing him his own smarmy ass in front of his whole office. It's lovely. And guess what? We found Cedra. She is all sunshine and rainbows and she is very pregnant. She says, thank you for finding my wallet. Some guy bumped into me on the subway seven and a half months ago. We've got Munch, Cragen, and Stabler all playing good cop. Cedra, you've heard about the subway rapist. He's hurt a lot of people. He didn't hurt me. We need your help. Can you identify him? Okay, it's that guy. It's Sal. All right, Cedra, good job. Stabler hands his arm to her and says, not my hand, I've been nursing a cold. Remember how bad my cold is all episode? Hey, I have a cold. She grabs his hand anyway. Remember how I said it was gonna get weird? We won't get a conviction if she doesn't say it's rape. Cragen says, then we'll get him to say it. They bring Sal back in and sit his ass down. Guess what, motherfucker? You got really lucky with those other seven victims, but there's an eighth one, and she's carrying your baby. He knows the jig is up. We're back out at Stapler's desk, and he's sitting there with Citra, and he says, you know, how are you feeling? Good. Yeah, me too. Remember how I said I had a cold? Well, you grabbed my hand, and now my cold is cured? like the fucking Green Mile or something. And just then, Sal gets walked out of the interrogation room and he sees Cedra. It's you, isn't it? It's me. Yeah, yeah, it's you with the flower dress. I knew when I did you, something beautiful could happen. That's my baby. And when I get out, we're gonna be a family, which is obviously fucked up and upsetting. And we close the episode watching Cedra fall apart. And that was Law & Order SVU, Season 1, Episode 19. Jum jum! <laughs>